Today, our featured speaker is Luis Agurto Jr., the CEO of Pest Tech and the city and county of San Francisco's citywide IPM contract administrator. With over 20 years of experience in practicing structural integrated pest management, Luis collaborates with teams across California to advance long-term reduced risk pest management strategies. And today, Luis will be examining the increasing focus on humane rodent management exploring the science behind the inner lives of rodents, the practical implications of policies, and the real world conditions that drive rodent populations and their impact on human ecology. So he'll be presenting a framework for realizable, reduced risk and responsible rodent management, and uh, we'll have some good opportunity to get audience participation um, and hopefully a rich discussion for what all this means for stakeholders here in the city and beyond. So I'll pass it over to you, Luis. Thank you, Shoba. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to set up my... Okay, so can you see my slide? Yes, we can Great. see it. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here and uh, having me to share my experience as an IPM practitioner working in the Bay Area and for the last 12 years or so California-wide as a instructor for structural IPM. Uh, in schools. Pest X mission is to cultivate a healthier urban ecology for California communities by empowering everyone to adopt smarter, safer ways to suppress and prevent, prevent pests, disease vectors, and their underlying causes. I'm very proud to have played a part on this committee and the evolution in pest management that it has contributed to. The following presentation is, however, my opinion based on my experience and in my understanding and is not uh, of the research that I've reviewed and is not uh, and does not reflect the opinion of the city and county or its staff. My goal with this presentation is to grow empathy for the people that need rodent management for their health, safety and quality of life and being a bridge for the shared ideals of responsible action. To this end, I've invited two commissioners from the Animal Welfare Commission Jane and Irina. Hi, Jane. I see you. I saw, I think I saw Irina too. And the CEO of Humane Wildlife Control and founder of the Humane Wildlife Association, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Two more things. I want to apologize up front that I know I have too many slides and uh, this presentation works better when it's viewed than with audio only. So for you, for those of you in the field working as you do sometimes, I'm sorry. Um, it'd be better if you could see some of the images. And I hope that we have plenty of time for discussion at the end with our guests and questions and contributions, because I know as practitioners in the field, you have a wealth of uh, information and a viewpoint that can really further this conversation. But let's get started. So the first R in the three R's of rodent management is realizable. So what I mean by that is whatever we do to manage rodents has to be effective. And how do we gauge efficacy? Well, we have to set clear and measurable goals to begin with. So for us, uh, as a company that provides pest management, typically that means we don't want rodents in people's living spaces, we don't want them in their workspaces, and we want our stakeholders to be happy, and we want uh, to comply with regulations. So the local enforcement agency has to approve of what we're doing. We want to keep our customers and stakeholders from being in problems. Simple, right? The second R is reduced risk. So we've been working uh, as a certified IPM company for 20 years now. Um, Pestec was the first company to become EcoY certified. We let and Green Shield certified. We certify all of our services as IPM reduced risk. Uh, however, there are some exceptions to the pesticide standards that they have uh, based on need. Uh, but in general terms, reduced risk means that we use target specific chemistry. So whatever chemicals or whatever action we're taking actually should only be affecting the pest and not uh, non-target animals and organisms and people and pets. Uh, we want to have target specific applications so minimize exposure to whatever it is that we're doing by making it, by delivering that application or that treatment to where the pest is, not to where uh, 
uh, people, pets, and uh, the general environment will reach it. And we want to medi mitigate pesticide drift. So we know that this is a big problem with rodenticides. They get everywhere in uh, our environment uh, through the rodents themselves. So rodents are at the bottom of the food chain. Everybody's looking to get a free meal by eating a rodent. And a poisoned rodent is an easy meal that gets picked up by raptors and by other wildlife. And, uh, and so we've been working with the city and county now for over a decade um, in managing rodents without using the riskiest rodenticides. And I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, we still are using uh, some rodenticides and we try to use them in this uh, reduced uh, risk manner. And now we see that California has adopted uh, the same restrictions and even gone further than San Francisco in some cases to further reduce and mitigate this risk. Uh, we also uh, work with materials that have uh, minim uh, that minimize toxicity. So in general, we use no danger or warning pesticide categories. There is uh, one exception with the giant gas destroyers, which I'll talk about later, that has a warning uh, label. Uh, we use no carcinogens with some exceptions for very specific uh, pests, no reproductive or developmental toxins with uh, contraceptives. There is an exception there and uh, no pesticides containing cholinesterase inhibitors. And then we have to minimize the risk to the practitioner. So in carrying out our work, there is inherent risk. Working in traffic is one of them, for example. Uh, other risks may be posed by fire. So again, the giant gas destroyers is a smoke bomb that you light and use to treat in burrows, and uh, there is a fire risk associated with them. And so you have to mitigate that risk by having a fire extinguisher or plenty of water or not using that tactic. And then the third R is uh, being responsible. So in the true sense of the word, responsibility and is responding to site-specific conditions. Not everything is going to work everywhere uh, you want to use it. So you need to choose the right tactic for the right location. Uh, you have to respond to change. What worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. Rodents readily adapt to the controls that we have uh, and the environment is continually changing. We know that we have a shortage of housing in California and the country overall. We need more housing. We know that we have a climate crisis. It's good for us to live in dense urban centers. Uh, that reduces our carbon footprint. Bringing on more housing will create uh, more, will be change and will likely create more rodents if we are not adapting to those changes. And then we need to adapt to changing expectations. So that's really what brings us here today is um, a, some proposed legislation that was coming to uh, ban uh, glue boards across the United States. That's how I, I got to meet uh, the uh, commissioners that are joining us today, uh, was attending um, a commission meeting where they were discussing that issue. So we do need to adapt to these changing expectations because this is uh, rising in the conscious of, of people across the country. Uh, we need to be responsible, responsible by educating through communication. So most of what I spend my time on and that we train our people on are the soft skills of communicating with customers, letting them understand the impact of how they are managing their spaces on pests, how they can change those things and what the risks are of any proposed action you wanna to take to manage uh, pests for them. Uh, we also need to lead by example. So responsibility requires leadership. And uh, the way that we train on that is to be a first mover. So you cannot go into a space that's cluttered and just give a recommendation to someone to reduce clutter and then apply a rodenticide. Instead, move move and make some space uh, in that clutter. Show them how the clutter directly relates to where rodents are living in that space so you can set a trap and you can get the ball rolling on making change in that environment. And then the fourth is uh, be proactive in your problem solving. So like my previous example, you'll know when things are uh, not gonna work if you're just relying on people to follow a written recommendation. What you should be doing if you wanna be effective is uh, take ownership over the problem and present a solution that they can readily adopt. 
Much of our responsibility is to put a price on it. If they have an open door uh, that's letting mice into the building, okay, what's it gonna cost to fix that door? It doesn't mean that they have to hire us to fix it. They can fix it themselves. They may have building engineers, they may have a handyman that can put screens on a building, keep rodents out, but by identifying the openings, communicating it, and then even giving them an action to buy from you helps to be a first mover to get that problem resolved. And these aren't crazy ideas. This is something that we see throughout the Bay Area now. There are specialists that are rodent proofers, and this is what they do, trap rodents, seal up houses. Uh, this is actually where I started in pest control, was in Lafayette, Marin, uh, the uh, Piedmont areas, very wooded, old houses that would get roof rats in them. And we, at that time, 25 years ago, uh, were doing something innovative. It was a three visit package where we would start with an inspection, set up traps where we saw the rodent activity, find all the openings, give them a, uh, an estimate for closing those things up. We'd come back a week later, remove the rodents. If they approved our estimates, seal up the openings and we'd leave our traps for another monitoring visit. Uh, we're not doing that service as much anymore just because of the cost it takes to engage with so many uh, individuals where we're better off serving um, larger entities at this point, but there's a variety of companies out there that are offering this, and uh, I can't speak to how good of a job that they do. All I know is that the offer's there and they seem to have some good ratings on Google. Okay, so, we need to talk about why manage rodents. So that's always one of the first questions that we have when we're doing IPM. Is this even a pest? Is this something that we can have a high threshold of? Uh, when we talk about spiders most of the time, you know, I'm like, hey, go eat those mosquitoes for us. I try not to kill, especially jumping spiders. I think they're the cutest little guys in the world. I would never want to hurt one. But when it comes to rodents, uh, we know that there are many impacts that they make on people. And one of them is on quality of life. I reviewed uh, this paper, Beyond Zoonosis, the mental health impacts of rat exposure on impoverished urban neighborhoods. In this paper, they reviewed a variety of publications and they um, came together with these three um, uh, impacts on the mental health of people that have to uh, live with rodents or that are exposed to rodents in their daily lives. Number one, rat exposure triggered headaches, dizziness, stomach aches, and elevated depressive symptoms. Uh, two, rat exposure is linked with other neighborhood level environmental stressors, which makes sense. The more disrupt disruption, disorder, the more rats we tend to have. And number three, that landlord inaction in managing rats led to elevated stress levels and conflict resulting in verbal abuse and threats of eviction. I know this firsthand. We've worked with many residential folks where we want to help them. We can trap the rodents and we can say, these things need to be fixed so this problem doesn't come back. And they're petrified. They're worried that if they talk to their landlord and the landlord's gonna increase the rent, the landlord's just gonna move them out. So there are protections for that, but this is a real uh, condition that's faced by folks. Uh, this is something that I think we really need to be empathetic about. We have a housing shortage. People are living in all kinds of conditions that are really not appropriate. Anytime you see the pizza rat, uh, pay special attention. Uh, this may come up later when you have to get your CEUs. But um, a really fascinating project that was conducted by uh, Dr. Chelsea Hemsworth called the Vancouver Rat Project uh, is one that you should go research and follow up on, they have lots of good information for you. One of her most notable quotes is that, we found that rat, rats act as a magnificent, magnificent sponge. They can go into the environment and absorb human pathogens and then give them back to us. So the point here is that rats in an urban setting are exposed to human pathogens. And when they pick up those pathogens in the environment, they can unwittingly transmit them in our spaces uh, through their behaviors, which might be eating our food, defecating uh, in our spaces, urinating in our spaces that then gets volatized and inhaled by people. So they're not inherently disease ridden. A rat in nature uh, is probably, is actually not um, 
any more prone to having diseases than we are. It's their exposure to those pathogens. The California Department of Public Health identifies uh, various uh, pathogens that rats carry. Uh, they have identified nine bacterial pathogens that they can indirectly transmit, and five of which that they directly transmit. They have three uh, identified three viral pathogens that they indirectly transmit, and nine that they can directly transmit. And then there are five pathogens that can be spread by the parasites uh, on those rodents. One of those pathogens is called marine typhus. Uh, rats vector this uh, virus. And the way that it works is fleas are infected with typhus. They bite a rat. Uh, then they, that rat has the disease. It moves it into the population. It's carrying more fleas on it that bite other rats, bites other animals, and then spreads that disease on. When those animals and their fleas come in contact with us, uh, those fleas bite us. Uh, or the flea dirt, which is the dropping of the fleas, uh, gets ingested or in a wound, uh, that can also spread uh, the typhus. So uh, this is uh, a disease that is endemic in California and in Texas. And uh, the symptoms of marine typhus begin uh, three to 14 days after contact with infected, infected fleas or flea dirt droppings. However, people do not know that they've been bitten by a flea or exposed by flea dirt. So they, they, they usually aren't getting treatment right away. Risk factors include time spent outdoors or in contact with particular animals, especially rats, possums, and free roaming cats. Severe illness can occur in some people, but deaths are rare, only estimated to be 1% of all cases. Almost all cases resolve completely with appropriate antibiotics. However, if the disease is not treated promptly, some people with the disease will need to be hospitalized. The disease can cause severe illness, including death. So the gentleman in the photo is from San Antonio. He didn't have health insurance, unfortunately, but luckily he was staying with his mom. She saw that he was sick, took him to the hospital, and uh, they were able to uh, start a GoFundMe to pay for his hospital expenses later on. He almost died from sepsis and he lost, uh, his hands were amputated and portions of his uh, feet were also amputated uh, due to the gangrene caused by the illness. Other pathogens that we have in California include hantavirus. So you probably remember um, this from a decade ago where uh, 10 people were infected with hantavirus and uh, while staying in Yosemite in some, um, some insulated tents. The uh, deer mice were living in the tents. Deer mice uh, may have hantavirus that then is uh, left in their droppings. When those droppings get volatilized through the air, people inhale it and uh, can contract the disease. In this case, three people died from the hantavirus. So why else do we manage rodents? Well, because of the risk of disease, the mental health uh, issues that uh, impacts that they make, uh, it's a legal requirement for us to manage rodents. California Health and Safety Code says that every person possessing a place that is infested with rodents must in good faith endeavor to exterminate and destroy the rodents by poisoning, trapping, and other appropriate means and to abate the conditions. The housing code identifies these conditions and labels them as substandard housing. housing. Inadequate sanitation, so a lack of adequate heat, space, ventilation, water, sewage disposal, waste storage and removal, pest infestation and mold, structural deterioration and accumulation of weeds, junk, garbage and rodent harborages and stagnant water are all considered substandard housing. All, all are conducive conditions that create rodent problems and must all by law be enforced and abated. So we have IPM in the health code from the very beginning. We're not allowed to have entry for these things, for rodents. We're not allowed to have food accessible to them, moisture accessible in the form of stagnant water or places for them to live, but we do. So let's talk about the rodents themselves. We have three commensal rodent pests that we manage in California and the nation. Uh, Norway rats, Norway rats are the ones on the left. They are the bigger, bulkier rat. Uh, they're called wharf rats. They're called sewer rats. They're the ones that typically burrow uh, near trash cans, 
You may find them in uh, fields. Uh, they like to eat, uh, you know, garbage. And so meteor foods, uh, these are the rats that you see in New York City uh, and all the press coverage that they get. Uh, we also have roof rats uh, in California in the Bay Area. Uh, roof rats are an arboreal species of rat, which means that they live in uh, trees. Uh, they like to follow tree lines, get themselves into attics, live in our attic spaces overhead. These rats uh, are commonly infested with tropical rat mites, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, and they tend to be more neophobic than the Norway rat, which makes sense. If a Norway rat is on the ground and it's making use of garbage and making use of the things that fall, they're gonna want to go explore that garbage and those novel things in their environment. Where a roof rat is in an attic space or on trees and eating the fruits and the nuts and the seeds that are in those locations, uh, new things that it's not used to seeing are going to uh, give it pause and it'll tend to avoid them, making them uh, more challenging to manage. And then we have the house mouse, with that, which everyone is familiar. The house mouse uh, is the smallest of these um, rodent pests. Uh, they live indoors in a very small footprint of about a 30 uh, square foot radius. Uh, and uh, they live very closely with people feeding on our food and do not require water uh, as much as the other rodents do. Uh, roof rats and nori rats need about an ounce of water a day. Um, the house mouse gets its water uh, from the moisture in the food that it's consuming. So here you go. You got everything here. You have Harbridge, which is open real estate uh, on this little hillside. Uh, you can see their burrows. You have uncontained trash all along here that is feeding the rats. Uh, you have everything that we talked about uh, that's not being followed in that health code. And uh, the outcome is Norway rats. During the pandemic, uh, we got called to a site that was having a tremendous rat, uh, Norway rat infestation. You can see in this kitchen, you know, really dark um, rubbings. Rubbings are the oily residues that rats leave behind when they are uh, moving through an opening. So all of this is uh, caked on uh, sebum or sebum, which is that oil or rubbing. Uh, and what was happening here is they had uncontained garbage. Uh, because of the pandemic, the place was in quarantine. I don't think they were having any pest control service. Uh, there was a light well that I think people were throwing trash inside of, which was on the other side of this bathroom. And the rodent population exploded. And they were literally chewing through walls, invading the kitchen, and uh, creating general hysteria. So um, that is not a great one. We know that rats uh, do live in the sewer system and use the sewer system to move throughout a community. Uh, this isn't always the case, and it's not necessarily that there's a huge uh, population of rodents in the sewer, but there is signs of activity in the sewer. We know that there's water, there's the food that we flush down there, there's the grease buildup that shouldn't be flushed, that is. Uh, there's harborage in the nooks and crannies between the old brick line sewers and there's access to the surface. Many times that access is happening from trees that are planted in the tree wells on the street, that then the roots of the tree are capping lateral lines that move sewage from a building to the main sewer. Rats are able to come out of that lateral line and uh, live in the tree well, and then spread to other parts of the community. So we do have a program uh, in the city and county of San Francisco treating uh, uh, sewers where the old brick line sewers, where this is uh, where the most heavily concentrated in urban environments and uh, by uh, directive of uh, the Department of Public Health based on um, reports. We know that uh, nori rats like to burrow. This is uh, a brewery that we worked at that had a spillage of grains that they were using to make beer. And so they had a huge Norway rat explosion. And this is under the building. We worked there for a period of time uh, doing all kinds of things, including cleanup of that spillage. And they never paid their bill. So that was a very painful experience. I'm just gonna gripe about that one time. Um, so examples of roof rats. So we know roof rats like to be uh, usually up high. This is uh, activity that was in an attic space of a school. 
Uh, we did some pre-baiting. So we set up traps uh, with food on them, uh, bait to attract them with the traps unset because we know that these uh, roof rats are neophobic. Uh, you can see that the rats were comfortable. They ate the bait, they defecated on the trap, they urinated on the trap. Uh, now it's time to go set those traps and to remove those roof rats and look for the openings and where they got in and to seal it so they can't come back. Roof rats will many times um, nest uh, in void spaces in attics. So there's a wooden platform for people to walk on in the attic. In this space, uh, you can see where they chewed around the insulation on these pipes. Uh, and so those rats are nesting down there. If there are tropical rat mites associated with these roof rats in this building, that's the location you would want to treat. Uh, the product that we have found to work the best for controlling tropical rat mites uh, is one that does have a carcinogen. So we have that reduced risk um, certification. That's one where we would get an exemption for using uh, a product that would control those tropical rat mites and help suppress the biting. If you do not treat tropical rat mites when you are killing the host animal, which is the roof rat, you're gonna see more tropical rat mite bites because the tropical rat mites need food, they'll invade the inside of the home and, uh, and people will suffer from it. Uh, here's another um, instance here in San Francisco at a community building where the, um, the damaged wood, I think um, probably from water damage, it's wood rotten, rotten was chewed through by roof rats. And so now they're able to get uh, access to the space. In this um, situation, the site that we were managing wasn't creating the problem by feeding rats, but they ended up being the harborage for the rats. Where the rats were actually feeding was next door at a chicken coop. And so um, this is something we commonly see uh, in urban areas where you have chickens, you have rats. And I hope we have time at the end of this uh, uh, presentation to talk about that. What is a good chicken coop design? Uh, that is actually rat proof because I would love to have backyard chickens, but my wife won't let me because she knows of this problem because uh, she also works with us and, uh, and also the flies that uh, chickens uh, create. And then very common situation that you see in buildings is you have some new utilities installed, some work done. And yeah, why open a little hole when you can open a big hole for that pipe and why close it up when you're done when you can leave it there because no one's going to see it anyway. So I have no idea how long this was. This is a building we've been working on for a long time. Uh, we finally discovered this after a period. This, this has been some time where the rats were getting in. So we have to do some uh, trapping here. Uh, we'll see if we can remove that population of rats and then patch it up so they don't come back. As I mentioned, roof rats are in trees, finding their food sources there. So here's some pest damage that they did to a lemon tree by girdling the tree or chewing on the bark around the tree. Uh, and this is very common in uh, San Francisco. Uh, we also see them eating, uh, ruining someone's avocado toast. So not only do they impact mental health, spread disease, uh, but there's also property damage and um, theft of agricultural production that we should not um, sleep on. Okay. So now we get to a kitchen setting and we're dealing with mice. And so this has been an ongoing struggle with this location. Where are the mice? Where are they coming from? Uh, we pulled out all our guns. Uh, my brother was there with me. I was there and we went looking around and they'd done so much work. They trapped, they cleaned, they, they, you know, identified doors that needed to be sealed. But where were the mice? Why did we still have them? So this is under um, a countertop. There happens to be a bagel slicer on top of this. And that bagel slicer is cut through bagels. Seeds are falling every day. That is the mouse's number one favorite food are delicious little seeds. And uh, you can tell that there is some rubbing on this you know, electrical uh, conduit right here. Uh, someone had screened this up, probably someone on our team. What I thought all of this was probably coffee but now i i don't think so because if you look closer you can see there's a little dropping in this cutout right here and the mice were living within inches of the bagel slicer so they were living in the space between the cabinet and the countertop a little void 
uh, and they're harvesting the, the seeds every day. So this is a common thing for you to be thinking about. Everybody is, when you're dealing with a really problematic rodent problem and mouse problem in particular, you really wanna start looking like beyond the footprint. It's always right there under your nose and you just have to look at it from many different angles and look at it again and look at it with a different tool and uh, you'll discover where it is. So you can see mouse drop, one mouse dropping in the left, but when you use a black light and fluorescent, you can see the urine droplets on the right. You can see where the mice are getting under the cabinet. This is all urine where they keep coming in and out of the cabinet and are living inside that, uh, the voids of the cabinet space. And then offices. So of course, you know, in this country and everywhere you go, even the poorest people have too many things. And we take these things, fill up our homes, then we get storage units and fill those storage units up. And then we bring those things to work with us and we fill up our office desks and we fill up our cubicles. And then we eat at our desks and we invite the rodents in and they live right there among us. So this is a constant struggle that we have. Uh, one of our customers at the Academy of Science uh, has a team of folks that routinely go through offices and do desk checks because they know that if they are eating at their desks and are collecting too much clutter, that they're going to end up having a, a mouse problem there. So that kind of cultural uh, engagement is something that we tend to avoid until we have, you know, the real urgency to do so, but is, is where we need to make a change for uh, long-term sustainable rodent management. Cubicles are uh, another bane of our existence. They uh, create a couple conditions. Number one, they become mouse nests. Where you have a hollow void that over time, little uh, hatches are open to put you new utilities or they break down, like in this case, you have rodent droppings and the mice directly living in the cubicle wall. The other condition that they create are these little dead corners and spaces around the cubicles that um, that people abandon things in. And so if there's food in there, there's nesting material, that's where the mice are gonna be. We had situations where an office is infested with fruit flies and the garbage cans are clean and they remove everything daily. Well, somebody left some bag lunch, some soda bottle in the corner of the room where no one can see, never gets to, and that fermented and created a fruit fry problem for everybody. So uh, design and layouts of spaces is uh, a real consideration for long-term rodent management, dealing with clutter. Go look in any office, go look in any house. If your closets are stuff like this, you're more likely to have mouse problems. And uh, what looks like a space that you can't get into and deal with, you know, these are mountains and valleys for mice easily to go make, you know, condos and, you know, live with complete abundance. You have mice living under pocket doors in some cases and mice living in doors in some cases. So this is another instance of a kitchen that had a mouse problem. I mean, they have all the conditions. Doors are open. They feed kids because it's the school site. Kids are outside and they keep getting mice in this kitchen area. What to do? We have traps set up. We've been monitoring. They are stepping up their sanitation uh, and we just can't find where they're coming from. And uh, because we had been there every day, uh, the janitor came and pulled us aside and said, hey, I keep seeing, you know, this insulation right here or whatever this stuff is, what is it? And we hadn't seen it before because she had swept it up. And so she was removing that evidence uh, that we needed. And once we saw it, it was very clear that the bottom of the door had little gaps in it and the mice had made a home in the kitchen, hollows of the door. So what do you see here? I'll tell you what I see. These are very small units that people are scratching out very good lives. They eat whole food. They prepare their food. They dry food in some cases. They make use of every single nook and cranny to store their items. It's not clutter. This is just people living their lives in a very tiny footprint in a very dense urban area uh, and doing the very best that they can. What you can't see are the rodents. And uh, where do you think the rodents are? Typically, uh, we know they're mice. You know, you would look behind this furniture, behind this refrigerator, under this thing. The majority of the rodents 
uh, in this picture, we're on this top shelf because that's where the uh, pantry was. And so it's over here in the corner. Not until we started peeling back the layers of the onion were we able to find the concentration of rodents in that unit. How about the unit on the right? If you, want to open, go up, if you pull up the sheets on this bed, every square inch of space there has a container, has something stored there. Uh, we haven't been able to find any rodent droppings in there yet, but there's only so far that you can look and so much disruption that you want to make in someone's life. So there's a balance that we have to strike. And then other evidence. So things that you want to look for for rodents are the spaces in between different building elements. So this is a prominent building downtown uh, where rodents were chewing through these seals in these granite blocks. Uh, this is also common to see uh, in the cold joints between buildings. Sometimes they're covered up, sometimes they're not. Uh, other buildings, uh, the same building between their buildings will have a rubber seal between them. Many times rodents chew through those. And then let's not forget about doors. So we constantly hear about door bottoms. You need door bottoms to stop drafts. Well, don't forget the astragals, which are the spaces in between the doors. Don't forget the spaces on the sides of the doors that need a gasket. And then you have these sliding doors where you can put on a solution, but if someone uses it as an emergency door and swings it open, those solutions are busted and you gotta reinstall them. So we need better design for doors. I mean, that's a whole other project to work on. Okay, so we're still working through IPM for rodents. Now let's get to monitoring and treatment thresholds. So we use many times uh, inspections to monitor, but we also use traps. And when we're using traps as a monitoring tool, um, you know, it's the same device with a different purpose. So if we're monitoring, we set traps, we catch a rodent, we identify what species it is, we want to see if the population is changing over time so that we know that something is triggering, triggering this population to grow. Uh, when we want to manage rodents, we're combining trapping and all those prevention things that we've already talked about, modifying the environment to keep them from coming back, to keep them from having the food and the water and the spaces to live that they need. Uh, and then we need to keep records to evaluate our program. So I love this photo because this is a science teacher and he kept his, he did, he was doing his version of IPM for monitoring. He just wasn't doing IPM because he wasn't combining, you know, this data with an action to stop the rodents from coming back. And some of the rodents he was catching were deer mice that we know spread hantavirus. So, I mean, this is cool, but it's not IPM because we have enough data here to show that something needs to change so that we don't get mice in this closet anymore. There are new monitoring tools. Uh, our uh, technology partner, Vector Patrol, uh, uses, uh, uh, is providing us with some. One are uh, the sensors that we can use inside of ceiling spaces, in the spaces in between buildings, where rodents can access and where people and other things generally don't. Uh, we can install these sensors and they can give us a read on if there's movement happening. We can then put traps in those locations, trap out those rodents and validate that we got a control when we, we no longer have any more motion moving in those spaces. This is a pilot project that we have uh, running in Portsmouth Square in Chinatown. Uh, the dot on the top left corner is where we have a hot spot of activity that also happens to be where people feed birds and where the trash is stored on the site. Okay, then we get to setting action thresholds. So we know that we are trying to prevent an injury and those injuries are medical injuries like the diseases or in this case, tropical rat mite bites. They can be economic and they can be aesthetic. And the idea with setting a threshold is that we are going to identify level of that population that we need to take an action at before it creates that injury. I really don't know what that level is. Uh, my point of view and our point of view as a company, and I think in IPM is that we wanna start managing pests by abating conducive conditions. So we will take action before we even do any, uh, before we even find a pest. Uh, but that action is about prevention. So here's an example of, um, you know, 
it is a question. Like, how many rats is too many rats? We know that New York City is famous for its rats, and uh, they also um, have a full recovery for tourism. So rats aren't keeping um, tourists away from New York City. Do they have too many? Well, we also know that they have an increase in lept uh, leptospirosis in uh, New York City. So is that because they have more rats? Are there some other condition that's uh, spreading this pathogen to people? I don't know. I think uh, the whole point that I really wanna make is um, it's not about populations of rodents, it's about managing conditions is what our focus always has to be on. And then record keeping and reporting uh, is the last element that we're gonna talk about here in IPM. Um, back to Dr. Chelsea Hemsworth from the Vancouver Rat Project. Uh, she is attributed to saying that we probably know more about polar bear ecology than city rats. And that's because it's very challenging to study rats in an urban environment when there are laws that say we can't have those rats there. And there is stigma in having those rats there. So we are kind of in this rock and hard place where we need more information. We know we don't want these organisms, but it's really hard to study them in their environment. And we don't uh, put the resources out there to really um, to do that. Uh, this paper published in the Journal of Urban Enco uh, Ecology titled Trends in Urban Rat Ecology, a Framework to Define the Prevailing Knowledge Gaps and Incentives for Academia, uh, Pest Management Professionals, and Public Health Agencies to Participate is all about that. And the idea is uh, we collect data in our IPM programs, we just don't share it. And if we did a better job of sharing that data with researchers, validating that data, making sure that it's high quality, uh, we would have uh, better data to guide uh, better decision making and policy. Uh, I was uh, informed about a uh, webinar on uh, conducted by the Lights Out Coalition uh, in New York City. This group is um, running a pilot using contraceptives uh, in uh, two boroughs, I think it is, or uh, some different sites. And um, and they're all about the data because they really need to show that what they're doing is working. And uh, so they've created a data portal that is tracking consumption of the contraceptives that they're deploying. We also have a project that we've applied for with the Department of Pesticide Regulation with this same motive in mind. Uh, there's constant policy changes that are happening in California pertaining to rodent management. Uh, we would like there to be more data in regards to the need for rodent management and to the existing actions that are being taken and whether or not they are effective so we can emphasize those things that are going to work best so our project is to um, crowdsource that data with a rat catch and carcass app where we're going to be working with vector control districts and other professionals perhaps even uh, retail purchasers of traps uh, to track the number of rodents they catch, where they're catching them, the um, you know sex, age, uh, and its and type of rodents. And then we also have uh, as part of this project uh, the idea that we're going to be installing uh, sensors and smart traps in a neighborhood scale so that we can validate the use of alternative methods to manage rodents, uh, including prevention in terms of abating conditions, but also contraceptives. Uh, and the use of gas and other things. Okay, let's get to the fun part. I'm already 43 minutes in, so I'm gonna have to speed this up. Are you ready? So recognizing rodent sentience. So I don't know if you've been paying attention, but you see headlines about this all the time. Rats dream, they giggle, they communicate, they show empathy, they can help each other get out of a situation. Uh, mice pass the mirror test, so they actually can recognize themselves in a mirror. These uh, organisms are aware and self-aware, and they're very much like us. So we have siblings squabbling over uh, the leftover soup in someone's kitchen. I mean, it happens in your house, right? Look at the mice or the rats. They're doing the same thing. We got rats gentrifying neighborhoods. They move in. They kick out the guy that's living there now. That's not nice. And we have scientists that are training rats on how to drive cars. Why that's relevant to us. 
kids because they have so much capacity to learn. And as a professional, I mean, I know this already. Uh, if you're ever trying to catch a rat, you are going to run to the issue that you're being outsmarted uh, in different occasions. So rats and mice. So we know that these uh, are, you know, thoughtful, adaptable creatures that uh, really want to live. One more video, very quickly. This was a fun little uh, news thing that came out not long ago, where this guy kept on noticing that his uh, he'd go to bed and come back the next morning and his garden workshop shed was cleaned up. And so he put this camera to see what was going on and there was uh, a resident mouse that was just hiding in the bathroom. If only we could put that to use for us. All right, so what has this led to? This growing recognition of rodent sentience. Uh, it's this idea that rats have rights and that we should learn to cohabitate with rodents. Um, you know, in one sense, it's like we already are cohabitating and we have cohabitated with them forever, right? And the other one that they have rights, um, I just thought this was funny. Uh, PETA sent an empathy kit to uh, Mayor Adams after he declared uh, war on rats. And so, you know, I think that it's true. Rats, you know, they do have some rights. Uh, I don't think this rat got consent before he started making out with this intoxicated guy at the subway station. So this is a line that I'm going to attribute to myself, but I know I didn't point it. Your rights end when they infringe on someone else's rights. And this is something I've had to commonly say and or have said many times in presentations uh, in housing. And it's because people want to live the way they want to live. They want to be as filthy as they want. They want privacy and not want anybody to come to their door and do an inspection or to do any pest management. They want to have as many things in the world. And maybe in some cases, you know, stack things on their bed and sleep on a chair because they want so many things in that space. Well, when you live in a hoarded and cluttered situation, when you aren't maintaining yourself and cleaning them up, uh, up after yourself, and when you refuse to have any kind of inspection and service to manage pests in an apartment, uh, that is in a community of people that live in that apartment, you are creating conditions that are um, infringing on the rights of others to live in a safe and habitable uh, environment. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights also seeks to promote and protect the right to work in just and favorable conditions. So it's a right to be able to work without having pigeons pooping on your head or to have rats in your environment. The right to social protection, to an adequate standard of living, and the highest attainable standards of physical and mental well-being. We know that there's a conflict between rodent populations and human physical and mental well-being. We have, uh, which is why we really need to manage uh, rodents. But we can still do it in a humane uh, manner. So we can define humaneness as having uh, compassion or concern for the suffering of others and benevolence or well-meaning and kindness. So from my point of view, we've been doing humane rodent management all along because we, we are serving others to resolve their suffering or to minimize their suffering. And we do it with well-meaning um, reasons and with kindness. But now we want to bring rodents into this um, specifically and put them um, you know, in, at maybe not equal footing, but um, but give attention to their suffering. So our objectives of humane rodent management should be uh, long-term rodent prevention, number one. Uh, we should stop growing rodent populations so we don't have to kill as many rodents. And then number two, minimize the suffering from the rodent control action directly. So I'm gonna go very quickly through this, but this, these are non-lethal approaches to humane rodent management that uh, are recommended by the Humane Society International. And it's all about prevention, right? Clean up, store your food correctly, pick up after your pets, uh, empty your bins at nighttime, trim your landscaping so it's more difficult for rodents to find harborage in, secure your bird feeders, don't put bird food on the ground, keep a tidy um, uh, garbage area, and make sure that you have rat-proof compost bins. As part of our pilot project in Portsmouth Square, we wanted to see if we could uh, impact this behavior of feeding birds. So we did uh, working with some interns from the University of San Francisco, 
we um, had a peer pressure campaign where we provided some oranges to get people to talk to us. Uh, and then we also gave them information on why feeding pigeons there is hazardous to the pigeons themselves. So bringing them together makes them more likely to get uh, sick from one another. Feeding them food that's not nutritious is more likely to make them sick and also contributes to rodents and a general, you know, hygiene problems in the park. A funny interaction we had was this gentleman that said, hey, I don't care, arrest me. I'm gonna feed these birds. There's no way you're gonna get me to stop. So these are very strong feelings that people have uh, trying to you know, raise the consciousness and to raise the awareness of this issue uh, is going to be a, a big issue, but we obviously are not putting enough resources into this as a society. Uh, more prevention, seal them out, attach sweeps, block the holes, cover the spaces, use repellents, disrupt, um, rats and mice don't like disruption. Okay, that makes sense. You move clutter around. I mean, I know that if you're having a problem trying to control rodents, uh, one of the first things you should do is deal with that clutter, uh, tidy up the space, and you're going to catch more rodents that way, uh, for sure. Um, stop feeding wildlife and animals. Good luck. Uh, expose rat tunnels. This is an interesting one. I also heard this on a webinar with municipal rodent control programs. And uh, the idea was, well, just mess with the uh, burrows themselves. Where are those nori rats going to go when you do that? If you're doing this in a community garden and rats have invaded there because there's resources and you're disrupting them from the burrows there, are they going to move to the neighbors? Is that a problem? I think it's uh, definitely in contradiction with the state law. Uh, use repellents and annoy them. I do know that uh, repellents are the fastest growing um, rodent control product uh, today. How well do these things work? Well, we know these ultrasonic repellents, uh, there's no science to validate them. And I really don't know how well the rest of them work or where the rodents go. Uh, their last recommendation there is non-lethal last resort. Uh, live trap and relocate the rodents. So. Uh, one issue might be, will the rodents just return? The other issue is, how well are they going to survive with predators that are outside in those spaces, with other rodents that are living in those territories, uh, without harborage? I think they're very likely to suffer and die from exposure. One thing that you should also keep in mind is that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife requires that trapped animals be immediately released on the site they were caught or euthanized. So I think the intent of this law is number one, reduce suffering by transporting animals. Number two, to keep from moving diseases that are on those animals to other populations. We know rodents or rats in particular are a, a pathogen sponge. So if we are trapping them live in one area and moving them to another, we are likely to be moving those pathogens with them. I love this little video. It looks like a coyote frolicking in the bushes. Um, I know that it's hunting. I've seen the impact that wild coyotes in San Francisco have made on our resident rodents. Uh, I'm in favor of it. I think it's great. This is a bio control. It's a native species controlling an invasive species, uh, but there's risks, right? So you know that um, these coyotes aren't gonna discriminate between rodents and feral cats. They're not going to discriminate with the pet cat that's allowed to free roam. They might not discriminate with a small dog that's off leash in a park. And what happens when it attacks a small child? So um, the good news is I don't have to worry about that. We have animal care and control, and that's their responsibility. Um, so we can ask them if they're here. Uh, so what else? What other options do we have for um, non-lethal population control? Well, we have these contraceptives. and. Uh, this is the uh, project that the Lights Out Coalition is uh, launching in the next six months in New York City, and it's going to be a 12 month uh, trial and 12 months to write the report. So we should hear back with that from them. When would that be then? Like 27? Uh, meanwhile, we are uh, using uh, contraceptives, commercially available contraceptives in San Francisco. Um, we had tried a couple of years prior to use the liquid formulation, which we had problems getting the rats to eat. Uh, now we're using this new formulation of soft bait. Uh, is it working? All I know is that they're eating the bait. So how will we validate if it's working? So, oh, one other 
topic here um, that I think is interesting is the Lights Out Coalition is using a uh, pelleted contraceptive. So uh, what was explained is that the pellets are good because uh, it gives an opportunity for more rats to get into the station and take the bait back with them to their nests. And so you may have like a dominant rat that ends up hogging that food and by letting them move the bait around, you get more uh, rats uh, exposed to it. So I don't know if that will be a conflict in California. I know in California, we're supposed to maintain any rodenticide uh, needs to be anchored within the station just to stop that from happening. Uh, and I do believe a contraceptive is a rodenticide because it is being used to control, manage, suppress, repel um, rodents. But according to the speaker on this, uh, this is a medicated feed and does not have the same laws. So I heard that there was a um, pesticide use um, enforcement person here in the meeting. I, I pose you that question. Uh, so how do they plan on validating efficacy? Well, in one of their tests, they looked at cumulative uh, damage to rice crops. Uh, in a paper they published in 2022, they judged it by the amount of uh, feeding over time. So there was a decrease in feeding on the fertility product or the contraceptive. They're calling that uh, a reduction in the population. Um, I just have a question of if the rats stop eating it because of the variety of rat rodent behavior and rats, you know, may not like the taste of peanut butter and they want to eat something else. Can you say that it's actually reducing the population or is there just less feeding happening? How would we validate it or do we intend on validating the efficacy of the contraceptives that we use? Um, we know that if the contraceptive is working, we should be catching less juvenile rats over time. So uh, we will be doing night trapping, we'll be using traps in the field. And if we can see that we have declining juveniles, that might be one measure. Uh, if we have less rodent visits to stations or to where we have these sensors would be another, uh, and then less burrows as we count those burrows and destroy them and see what reopens. Um, if we see less over time, we would consider that uh, a reduction of population. Running out of time, but now I want to talk about the lethal control of rodents in a humane manner. So I, I reviewed uh, the only publication I could find for this, which came from New Zealand uh, and New Zealand uh, identifies or certifies some traps as being more humane than others that they are allowed to be used. So, but from uh, least humane to most humane in terms of um, these items, we're gonna say um, the least humane are passive killing. So those would be glue boards that capture and hold a rodent, uh, but then, you know, it dies over time, usually from exposure. So it's uh, losing heat and it's, um, uh, I think that's mostly how it dies or from dehydration and starvation. Multi-catch traps are similar where they, they're caught inside the trap. There's no killing mechanism. Instead, they die from exposure to cold or dehydration and starvation. And then there's less than lethal catches. So that's where you have a trap that's designed to kill uh, instantly, but because you catch it by the arm, you catch it in a way that doesn't kill it, it dies by exposure, starvation, dehydration, or trauma and bleeding out. Um, the more humane would be a quick kill trap, uh, which this New Zealand publication says should be within 30 seconds with some variance allowed uh, within their study. And then uh, modified atmospheres or the use of gases uh, can be considered the most humane because uh, it's a quick kill and uh, the rodents succumb to a loss of consciousness before uh, they they die. I didn't review rodenticide specifically in this because I, I wasn't able to find a publication that evaluated rodenticides for the humaneness. Uh, but we do know that rodenticides, depending on the type, take between four and 12 days. Uh, what we were always trained is that rodents, you know, uh, it's anticoagulants cause internal bleeding. They basically lose energy, go back to their burrows, and they go to sleep. Uh, from the little bit of research that I did, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it seems to be much more traumatic than that. Plus the non-anticoagulant rodenticides uh, have different modes of action where there's calcification of the liver, where there's uh, all kinds of illness. It seems to be um, 
it seems to be quite suffering uh, mode of death. As I said, I, I studied the research coming from New Zealand or their papers where they reviewed this. Uh, they have a predator-free 2050 plan where they intend to remove all invasive mammals from the island to preserve their native biodiversity. Uh, but they want to do that in a way that's sustainable and humane. Uh, and so I'm going to start with glue boards. So in this uh, review, they looked at uh, rodent monitoring and control methods as alternatives to glue boards. And uh, they looked at the criterion that people listed for the use of glue boards and then wanted to find the alternatives. So uh, the criterion that glue boards are non-toxic was true. They said as an alternative that fumigation is non-toxic once it's ventilated, which is true, but it is toxic when it's in the space and also has some other impacts to the environment. Traps are non-toxic. And then they also looked at cellulose baits, which they also specified, and I know from experience, it's hard to get rodents to eat. So I really don't think it's valid. And then ultrasonic deterrents, which are also not validated by any scientific research or data. Uh, then we have uh, the criterion that they're non-contaminating. So glue boards are used, in, especially in food production facilities, because they are non-contaminating, and they tend to capture the rodent, capture um, you know, what it leaves behind and ectoparasites, but not all of them. Um, whereas fumigation is not non-contaminating and traps are not non-contaminating because the animal's left there, it defecates and urinates after you catch it and the ectoparasites can get off its body. However, if it's inside of an enclosed container, it is more contained. The biggest distinction between glue boards and alternatives was the utility. So you, Glue boards are dual purpose. So that means that you can use them for rodents and insects. They're used as barriers. They're not susceptible to accidental triggering and they fit in tight spaces. Where trap and bait stations, the heights of these things, you know, like a trapping station, for example, it will not fit into a very low uh, you know, uh, clearance space, like under equipment in particular, especially in kitchens, like a glue board will and uh, traps can be accidentally triggered with vibration. Glue boards are said to hold carcasses in one place. It's true, but sometimes the rodents can escape, or if you're using a glue board on a, on a rat, you can see the rat run off with the glue board. Fumigation doesn't hold anything. You're gonna have things dying in different places. Uh, traps, they said no, but I think an enclosed trap will hold a carcass. I think that's an error. And baits, no, we know that a rodent will consume the bait and die elsewhere. Uh, glue boards are said to have 100% capture rate. They said no, obviously nothing has 100% uh, control, whereas we know uh, the other alternatives also are not 100%, except for fumigation within the confines of the tenting um, should be 100%. Uh, fumigation is not something that we can readily do here in San Francisco because our buildings are up against each other, and so you would have to fumigate a you know, like a city block if you wanted to do control that way. Uh, they're said to be effective against trap shy rodents. Well, not necessarily. Um, rodents adapt. And so they do feel the glue. Uh, and if they feel it, they may avoid the trap. Uh, if over time, if that's the one control you're using, they will fail for sure. However, you may use glue boards when your other traps are ineffective uh, to catch them uh, as a blunder trap. You're putting it in a runway and you're not trying to catch it with a, uh, you know, a bait or a lure. You're just trying to catch it as it's running through a space. Uh, and then uh, the alternatives, same idea. They're not necessarily more effective for reducing trap shyness. You have to rotate. No license is required, correct, except for fumigation. I also added that uh, another advantage of glue boards is that they require less hand dexterity. So I see a lot of elderly folks. I see many people buying these things from a hardware store that otherwise would not be able to set, you know, a common uh, snap trap. Uh, there are some snap traps that are easy set. I don't know if they're going to be as sensitive as the, the best ones, the standard ones. Uh, the fate of trap. OK, so what happens when you catch something on a glue board? It takes a long time for them to die from exposure. If you want it to be humane, then you're going to have to handle the trap, which could uh, be a risk to the person that has to dispatch the rodent, and you have to continue observing the trap. Whereas a kill trap, you don't have to observe it, it's set, and it should be a quick kill. 
um, fumigation uh, also would cause less suffering. And then they're considered to be least ex expensive of all the controls that are available, uh, except you can only use them once, whether or not you catch something. Whereas the other controls vary in price dramatically. So I'm going a little longer than I should. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, they also examined different quick kill traps. So the standard Victor snap trap, if it's modified to have this hood on it where you're controlling how rodents are approaching the trap, is considered to be humane because then you're preventing a uh, less than lethal catch where you catch it by the arm, for example. Same thing goes for these clamshell type traps when they're used inside of a container. Uh, many other different kinds of traps when used inside of a box in this crazy trap called Lanuski, which a rodent goes inside this thing and it puts a rubber band around their neck. It's a crazy thing. I bought one as, as an artifact and then I saw that they actually certified it. So it's kind of crazy. We use, this trap is called the professional version because it's an extended trigger. This is what we use because it expands the trigger point, making it more likely to catch a rat or a rodent. Um, this would not be considered humane according to their standard, unless it's inside of a trapping station like this. There's also uh, electronic traps, which have a very quick kill within that 30 seconds. Uh, and then, will report to you that you have a catch, which allows you to service the, the trap, which reduces the amount of wasted time checking empty traps and automatically compiles that data that could be useful for um, studying in the future. Then we have modified atmospheres. So I talked about the giant gas destroyer, which is basically displacing oxygen with the smoke that it generates. There is the carbon monoxide device, Carbon monoxide treatment of burrowing animals is considered humane as it induces a loss of consciousness before death. And then we have the CO2 tank, which is called the IGI. This product uh, also induces a loss of co consciousness before death. And according to the American Veterinary Association is a humane way to euthanize animals. However, for the carbon monoxide generating devices, there's new regulations in California where they cannot be used within a certain distance of a structure, inhabited or not. So in an urban setting, when we're trying to manage burrowing rodent pests within 65 feet of a structure. So for me, this is a big loss of an otherwise humane, effective uh, part of our toolkit. So let me wrap this all up for us. Uh, we know that our primary motive should be to prevent pests. But we also know that we need to have a toolkit to do control. Even the CDC is called the Center for Disease Control and Prevention because they collaborate to create expertise, information and tools that people and communities need to protect their health from through health promotion, prevention of disease, injury and disability and preparedness for new threats. So prevention and control work together. We know that rodents are highly adaptable. So one control may work today and may not work tomorrow. You need to be able to use other controls. We know that prohibitive rules may cause more suffering. So I think that we should be mitigating the suffering from the use of blue boards uh, instead of prohibiting them completely. Again, that's an opinion. Uh, ultimately, whatever is decreed upon, whatever the rules are, we'll be able to follow it and, uh, and it'll be good and it'll be fine. But uh, there's going to be a period of time when those conditions continue to exist that grow pest problems and people will have to live with rodents in their spaces, causing mental health impact, causing uh, health impact from diseases and economic harm. The Pest Management Alliance uh, from the UK uh, created this code of best practice for the humane use of rodent glue boards. Uh, it's worth considering. It's glue boards in the, in the hands of licensed professionals only, used as a last resort, and monitored frequently so that the rodents can be humanely dispatched when caught. And uh, other rules, such as the carbon dioxide generating devices, uh, I think we should be mitigating the risk of CO and not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So one way we could do that is by monitoring those nearby structures with carbon monoxide devices 
instead of saying, you may not use that. That's it. That's all I have for you in this presentation.